Okay, I guess we should start now. Um, it's 3.05, but there might be some people just joining us a little bit late. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Kayla, part of the Asian Mental Health Collective. For those of you who don't know what that is, we are an organization dedicated to destigmatizing mental health within Asian communities um, worldwide. And we host um, workshops such as this, as well as roundtables. One of our main projects is a Facebook group called Subtle Asian Mental Health, which just provides a safe space for anyone and everyone to sort of share their mental health journeys and their challenges and to provide support for one another. So. Welcome, I'm very excited to have you. Um, this is the second workshop, part of our three workshop series called Family Closening. The first workshop, I think it took place a couple of weeks ago where we talked to children about um, ways that they can better communicate with their parents. Um, as I'm sure we all know, communication is such an important part of um, family dynamics and health. So um, today we have LMFT or Licensed Man Marriage Family Therapist, Jeannie Chang. She's joining us from North Carolina and Jeannie works with a lot of families as well as adolescents and college age students on mental health matters. So without further ado, I will pass this over to Jeannie so that she can introduce herself. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Um, I Thanks for the introduction, Kayla. Just briefly about me. I am, yes, an LMFT. I also have a certification in trauma just because I felt that was necessary as I was working with more families. I would find that to be the case, especially in not just Asian Americans, but Latinx, basically people of color. I found that was a big part of the experience because of acculturation, which I'll talk about. Uh, I have four kids. Uh, ages 13, I was head state, 13, 16, 18, and 20. So two are college kids, and then one in high school and one in middle school. So I also empathize with parents. And I always tell families when I work with them, uh, the, the, I think the unique part about my upbringing that has really played into what I do today with mental health is the fact that I grew up second generation Korean American where I felt like I assimilated pretty well. I'll talk about that word in our in the American culture, but I struggled with my first generation Korean American parents who, like I said, that's the first glimpse of your culture. So I had a, a lot of cultural conflict. So when I treat families today, I understand the kids, right? The kids being second generation, but kids could be anywhere from kids, kids, right? Children to adult children. And then uh, the parents who, who tend to be a little bit older, uh, maybe my age and up, I also relate to. Even though I'm not first generation, I grew up with that. And plus, I'm a parent. So it's a unique angle that I always give to empathize with both parties, right? Especially when I have some conflict in the room, which we will also talk about. So without further ado, let me get right into the content. Just so you guys know, I we have um, subtitles. So we're gonna have that. We're also gonna translate this. And um, so we'll be translated into many different languages, but what you might see is what's called simplified Chinese. And Kayla said that was common. So we're just gonna use that. And I will talk a little bit slower as I begin because I tend to be a fast talker from up north in New York. <laughs> um, so family closening. Today's more geared to parents. So more parenting. And it's about listening bravely to your kids. I just like using the word brave because it, exudes a lot. Language is very powerful. So, and it does take courage to listen, right? To hear feedback. This is my framework. And I model, I talked about this last or a couple weeks ago. Cultural confidence is just my version of cultural competence, which many of you guys, especially if you're in mental health, have heard that term. And I shared before, it came out by accident in a, spe in a speaking um, engagement I was giving to college students. And I just didn't correct myself and I decided to make it stick because I felt like people related to the word confidence instead of competence, which I think is not good enough. It's about practicing and understanding mental health and how it intersects with identity, intersecting with mindfulness practice and our resilience. So I'm gonna encompass all of that today. 
in one workshop, even though you could do many workshops in all of this, this is just my overview from the lens of a parent, of parenting. So hopefully the translation is okay. This is a, a great famous uh, quote that is the root of actually family therapy. I love this quote. I use it in everything. I even preach it in corporate. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Take a minute to soak that in to understand the meaning of that and how it relates to the family. And anybody know, oh, let me pull up the chat box because, oh, sorry, we are going to use the chat box today. Anyone know who said the quote? And I'm okay if you guys have heard of it, no, but I want to educate a guess of who said this quote. Sorry, let me get my chat box. Any takers, make an educated guess. Uh, come on, therapist, I might call you out, but... Ah, good guess, but no. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. You were brave to make the first educated guess. <laughs> math teacher in high school. Yes, many people know this. Oh, that's interesting that I was used in math, but um, ah, you're getting close to Carolyn. You're getting really close, but let's go ahead and say, uh, yes, it is a philosopher, so Aristotle. But here's the, here's the truth. People have claimed we're not sure if Aristotle said this, and of course family therapists say that, but no, I've done some research, I believe it came from him, but it's, it's really reframed and reworded a lot, but this is the crux of what I'm trying to get at. The whole, the family as a whole is stronger, it's worth more, it's more valuable as a whole than just individuals kind of existing together. And I say that, and this isn't a team building, you can use this in an organization, you can use this anywhere and think of it like that, how powerful you are together. So obviously this is called family closening. I defined this last time, but for parents and you guys listening first today, this is my definition. I am a solution focused therapist. So this comes from the angle of being solution focused and mindfully managing anxiety in the family. The anxiety term here is a loose term. It does not just mean emotions. It means everything, conflict to trauma, to stressful experiences in the home. I just mean everything and mindfully managing that mindfully with a solution focused perspective. So we'll talk about that. Parents, um, I feel like all of us always need to be reminded really what mental health is. And, and sometimes we kind of miss use the terms because it's really misused out there, right? It's intertwined with mental illness. So let me explain mental health, break it down very easy. It is literally our, the health of our mind. It is what we think about from the, the minute we get up to the, the minute we go to bed. It's simply just our overall well-being emotionally, right? So mentally, I'm sorry, emotionally, psychologically, socially, our well-being. Our mental health rides on the fact of how well we balance the things we go through life, life changes, life stressors, which I'll, which I'll talk about with our resilience, how well we're doing that, right? And sometimes we don't do so well. And that's why we have not so good mental health at times. That's part of life. It is important all the time. So every life stage, it's not like, hey, I'm going through this life stage. My mental health can go out the window. Let me just focus on raising kids, which I see a lot. No, it is important all the time, just like your physical health is. I mean, sometimes one would, I would argue, isn't your mental health more important because it controls everything? And then it is not the same as mental illness. So breaking down mental illness, this is just in a nutshell. There's so much more to this, but I'm just gonna give you an overview. It's really literally the diagnosis of a mental health disorder. That's why it gets intertwined. Like what a mental health disorder being clinical depression or depressive disorder, right? Bipolar, I'm not gonna get into that, but those are the things you hear, that is mental illness. It does cause significant, and I say significant where you can see their changes in behavior, their emotions, right? Their, um, their thought processes. It does show dysfunction, it results in dysfunction. And I say dysfunction as in, day-to-day -day functioning where even simplest tasks may be troublesome, right? Things that we normally can do easily, even with poor mental health, we can still do, but those with mental illness may really have uh, trouble with. And I wanna just pause right there because I didn't bring it in, but the stigma surrounding mental illness is because I believe because of that. We tend to stigmatize mental illness I know we say stigmatize mental health, but we're really stigmatizing mental illness because it results in such, okay, crazy is not the right word, uh, unstable behavior, 
I was just about to say crazy, but behavior that you're like, whoa, where you don't see that with physical illness. That's why there's such a stigma. And that's my, my me telling you this. And then one in five. So I just double check stats. Again, I always like to make sure I'm giving appropriate statistics. That is the continual statistics. It is pretty common being diagnosed with a mental health disorder. This is every year. And that's specifically for adults. I didn't even want to get into children and adolescents, but I want to share that number, meaning it's not so uncommon, right? And it should be viewed as a physical illness in the clinical circle. So parents, if you're hearing this, medical physicians, clinical providers like us, myself, will view it, medically speaking, like how to treat the symptoms, right? If you need medication, you need medication. Just like when you're sick, if you need medication, you need medication. So that's what I'm trying to get at. And so that's where I want to break down stigma. But today we're not so much talking about stigma, but that's where it comes from. I mean, you see some behavior and you're like, wow, okay, mental illness, right? Uh, again, two different things. And then this slide breaks it down just a little bit more. Again, I'm going to say it again, not the same thing, mental health. Today I'm talking about mental health. Uh, you can have really bad mental health. You can be in poor shape. And it can lead to a mental or physical illness. For instance, depressed symptoms where perhaps uh, I've seen this, you loss of a job, okay? Uh, you're about to declare bankruptcy or you have, and you don't have a job for a long time. And you're in that depressed state, lots of bad things happening. You are having trouble coping. And then you've reached a point of clinical depression or chronic depression because you've been in that state for a while. And then you get diagnosed with depressive disorder because you've been that way for some time. So that's an example. Physical illness, oh, you guys know when you're not doing well emotionally, many things can happen to your body. And I even have a personal testimony to that where I was sick for a full year, I kid you not, for a full year because of a toxic work situation. Um, and so that's, that, that's, that's, that's one bullet point. Second one, you can have poor mental health without a mental illness. So you can be struggling, and a lot of people are today. Granted, COVID, uh, all the things that have happened over this year with racist incidents, definitely not be doing well. But you don't, you're not diagnosed with a mental health disorder. But, you, but here's on the flip side. You can have good mental health where you're doing pretty well. Okay, and I think some of us today, maybe we're doing okay, but also be diagnosed with a mental health disorder. I'll give you an example. Bipolar tends to get the stigma, you know, the movies that dramatize it. And it should be, um, most of the time, I believe, not always be treated with medication. I had, back then I was a patient because I was looking, working in primary care, had a wonderful, wonderful person, client that I really got to be attached with. About two and a half years, I treated him and his wife. But he came in because of really, really bad mental health where he was in, I guess, a, a very angry, depressed state because he was an executive at a, at a job and got laid off. And I think he had, I think it was a company that he kind of built, it was like a startup. So it was very complicated. But I had no idea that he had had a psychotic episode when he was in his 20s and he was diagnosed with bipolar one. So I'm trying to get at that because I found out by accident when he goes, oh, Jeannie, can you excuse me for a second? I gotta take my medication. I'm like. What medication? He goes, well, I'm a little late on my Depakote. Sorry, I'm bringing this up. This is important for you to understand. I'm like, oh, Depakote, huh, bipolar? So I went, I'm sorry. I, I'm assuming you're, <laughs> you're diagnosed with a mood disorder. He goes, yeah. And I had no idea. So I, and I, by that point, had known him over a year. So I'm trying to say he came in about something else, right? He came in with, at the time, struggling with something, still good mental health, like he was fine, but struggling with his work, I've met his wife a couple times, and but yet yeah, he had a mental health disorder. That's the example I'm trying to give you, okay? Hopefully that helps. By the way, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. This is meant to be informal. Mental health, now moving on to identity. Huge part of intersecting, right, with our emotional, psychological, social well-being, our sense of belonging. I mean, that's why in different stages of life, you struggle. Your identity takes a hit depending on what you're going through. This gives you who you are, your self-identity gives you that sense of purpose. Like, this is who I am. I feel good. Think about it, right? Your confidence. It is a psychological attachment. Of course, you're attached to yourself, right? In every way. And it's important to understand that identity is complex. It's not so simple. And it does change throughout your lifespan. And it's rooted in our cultural heritage, which is why we always talk about being Asian American, Korean American, Chinese American, all that stuff that we struggle with, race and ethnicity, all of that intertwines with our identity. 
Mindful identity is more of when I would say the emotional, psychological, social attachment. Who we are definitely has been shaped by our life experiences, okay? The things that we believe in, our core values, the principles that we adhere to, and when it, you know, when it gets pushed or shaken up or defied by parents or uh, other colleagues or whatever, we get shaken up. That's why. And when people tell you, hey, this is how you are, I want to say overall, your identity, you are the expert of your life. This is very important. Parents too, understand this. You, parents, are the expert of your life. Your kids are the expert of their lives. Your story is your reality. Everyone has a different story. And I love the exercises when we can go through storytelling and talk about our story in two minutes, by the way. You have to do it in two minutes. Um, and right off the bat, what, how would you tell your story? Because that's your reality. And now I tend to actually leave my story with being a parent because that's a big part of my identity today. But that's something I ask you parents, what is your story? But you are the expert. And I have said this to the kids as well, adult kids, whatever, that they are the expert. Then we have our cultural identity. And we're going to spend some time here. The acculturative stressors. I'll break that down, what that is. I'll define it for you. Intergenerational stressors. Okay, think about... What's passed on through generations, especially in the Asian culture, we're very much affected transgenerationally, okay? Um, even if it's not physically like that you're dealing with it, I granted, emotionally you hear about it, things are being said all the way around the world, doesn't matter, you're affected. And then that encompasses overall acculturation, the acculturation experience. I'm cracking up at the Chinese translation. Hopefully it's doing okay. These are the acculturative stressors that I generally have identified. I believe there are more, of course, you can always think of a lot, but a lot of it falls under these uh, stressors that I've identified. So authoritarian, authoritarian does not mean authoritative. I'd like to make that clear. Authoritative is a very balanced way of parenting. That's my goal for you parents. But authoritarian is more the, you know, the very tyrannical, my way, it's my way, my way, my way. Okay, you see that a little bit in our culture. I shouldn't say a little bit. You see that in our culture. Filial piety. This is where we have that duty, you know, to the elders before us, to our parents, right? Our parents' parents and so on, right? And we feel that over generations in our culture. Guilt and shame, definitely. You see that translate over culture. I mean, sorry, over generation in families. It manifests very differently, by the way. It, it looks very different for anybody and everybody. Um, Saving face. I just like that word. I was trying to think of the right word for that, but that is the best word. That is just where you're pretending you're just completely have a certain, I would say, smiley face or whatever that face looks like, but you're really hiding behind that. And it's basically looking good when maybe things are not so good, right? And making, almost showing that you are perfect, that we don't make mistakes. Oh my goodness, we should hide any imperfections. We are achievement and success driven. Again, when I bring these out, they may have a negative tone and you're thinking achievement is success driven. I'm bringing out stressors. That is definitely a stress when you're so focused on that, right? I mean, wow, sometimes you just never get there or you don't feel like you're there and you're never feeling good enough. That's part of what happens with that. Um, silence, being silent. We have that in our culture, not just surrounding mental health and mental illness, just in general. We don't really participate. You actually see this in corporate organizations as well. As well. Stoic. You know, kind of that like, oh, I'm not going to show you any expression. Or even if something's sad, you just kind of hold that in and just show this calm face, right? Collectivistic and conforming, group oriented and conform to the group. So not really individualistic, right? And suppressing emotions. We're not really, really great at being overly showy. And maybe some are, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to generalize, but this is just generally the stressors in our culture, parents. Okay, so think about that. Acculturation is your immigration experience. How well you have adapted to the American culture, or if you were Chinese and you went to another country, whatever country, whatever your host country is, the home country that you live in, is the acculturation experience. So for today, we're talking about the U.S. So integration is probably what you would think is somebody who is firmly rooted in their Chinese identity, but also actively participates in American culture where they're like feeling good both ways. We're like, okay, I get this. Yeah, I'm Chinese, but no, I, I love this part about the American culture. So you see them integrate American culture where they want. Assimilation is more of probably the kids, myself. 
second generation Korean American, where I fully identified with being American, wanted to be American. Even though I looked Korean, heard Korean, ate Korean food, I was like, mm, no, I'm American. So it's not really rejecting your culture, you just really assimilate into the US culture, uh, US society. Uh, separation is when uh, those, let's just give an example of Korean. If you just came from Korea and you just decide, I will have nothing to do with the US culture, I am Korean. So I'm gonna speak Korean, I'm gonna live in Koreatown, and you see that in some families and, and some people can get away with barely speaking English in the US. I mean, sometimes it still surprises me. And then marginalization. This is kind of special to me because I will point out that I tend to actually see parents more in this. Parents, I don't know if you fall on this, but it's where you actually don't feel like you belong to either culture. So you're on the outskirts, you're marginalized. You're like, no, I mean, I was, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, but I came here with my kids and then, now I can't go back to Hong Kong. I don't really relate to that culture. And then I'm, you, I'm not really American because I was 35 when I came here. That's tough. And you see that struggle. And then they're raising kids. So parents, I'm just trying to put you in that spot of wherever you are at. You're going to be thinking about it shortly because we're about to break out into um, breakout rooms. And I'm going to give you time to think about this. Why? Because this is a big part of who you are and how you parent. Intergenerational stressors, conflict and trauma. I like to make this clear. You tend to hear the word intergenerational trauma. But in my experience, not everyone has trauma. And I'll, I'll explain what trauma is. I actually see, tend to see a little more conflict, but this is my perspective. Conflict is very simple. You've heard it all the time, but it's really when you disagree, when you really have some discord between your beliefs you know, uh, your children's beliefs, whatever, and your, your, even your spouse's beliefs, partner's beliefs, you, you have different viewpoints, different values maybe. Um, and <laughs> I'm gonna point this out, a very normal part of family life. If you don't have conflict, actually sometimes, oh, oh yeah, we're fine, we never have conflict. Right then I have a red flag. I'd be like, okay, let me wave the red flag. I'm not saying I want you to say you have conflict. I'm just saying this is such a part of family life, work life, <laughs> community life, there is bound to be conflict if you're interacting with people. It's normal. I'm bringing this up because parents tend to not want to face conflict. It, it, so it must be addressed. It must be addressed. Doesn't mean that very moment, but you need to think of that. Not only just addressed, managed. Conflict is always about managing. Maybe they're, just because you address one conflict doesn't mean it goes away like that. It could continue to be the same over time. And then you have to manage that. Yes, exactly. Thank you. I love that. Um, Depanker, I love your, I love your explanation of that. It is. And it's, de it's definitely different, right? And then I will say at the very end, you see, it leads to disharmony. That was the best word. I say discord, but disharmony because you're, you're still in the family. So you, you still have love and there's some emotion there, but you're just not at peace, right? And I'm trying to build peace. That's always my goal, but I never say, oh, we're going to resolve conflict. You notice, no, I don't say resolve. I have learned not to say that. I tend to say manage it, address it, because there's always something, right? There's always some sort of conflict. That doesn't mean you're always in angst, not at all, but there's something that you always have to keep managing. Um, and then trauma, I'm going to explain this. Trauma, yes, you've all heard the word. It is a distressing event. It is a distressing experience in somebody's life. And Anyone can experience trauma. It doesn't have to look like a natural disaster. It doesn't have to look like a car accident, death, whatever tragedy that befalls you. It could be, and I've seen this in families, um, overwhelming stress because of a life event. Um, could be death of a loved one. I tend to see separation, divorce and separation. I didn't even touch on that, but that can be a very traumatic event in anybody's relationship, kids, even the spousal partner unit, especially if one partner doesn't want to separate, very traumatic. Um, job situations, bankruptcy, finances, all can be traumatic, okay? So it's not just that image of the trauma that you think, right? Or like the PTSD of like, you have to be in the army, you know, uh, or at war to experience that. And then emotional duress, this is different than distress. Duress is like that deeper, like rooted, like you are a mess. It is, it can cause that. And you see that. And why I'm saying this, parents, is I just want you to think about perhaps what you thought might have been trauma 
or you downplayed could be your trauma. It can definitely alter you. That doesn't mean you can't alter back or be be changed person. Not at all. Trauma takes some work, but I'm doing a distinguishing of conflict and trauma, and I want you to view it differently than perhaps you have in the past. Okay. So connecting mindfully, we don't need to do a breakout. So we're going to do the exercise here. Super excited because I get to see the subtitles. Hopefully they're making sense. Uh, these are three questions that if you can pull up your chat box. And I would love for you to think about, I'll give you like some few, few seconds really to think about these three questions. They're really two, but which acculturative stressors are a struggle for you? And you notice the way I worded that, like you're over the struggles. No. What do you struggle with? What stressors that, that translate in your culture, our culture that you still struggle with? How are you trying to reconcile them? And what I'm trying to get at is how are you working on it? What are you doing? Think about it. And then the last question is, what have you shared about your parenting? I mean, uh, sorry, your acculturation experience. What have you shared about it? What do your kids know about the way you were raised and then came here? So take a second and yes, we're not going to break out, but if you could answer it in the chat box, that's a lot of questions though. Feel free to answer what you want to answer. I do want to hear some bits and pieces of everything. Let's start with the acculturative stressors. What are your acculturative stressors? I can always share mine because we all have them, but I would like to start with the parent sharing theirs. And depending on the size of the group, it's not too big, you could also get off on um, your, you can unmute and share. That's a little bit more brave, but you're, you're welcome to do that. I'm not gonna force anybody, but it'd be great. I think for the sake of uh, the size of the group, we're gonna do it um, together. Sure, great question. A culture of stressors, I'll go back. You beat me to it. I was actually going to do that. These are just some of the ones that what I've seen. And again, this is the overarching themes, but you could have a lot of sub themes underneath it, right? Authoritarian. So these are the, the occultative stressors that I'm talking about to Panker. Take a look at that and see which one you struggle with. <laughs> All of them. And that is completely what I would say a normal answer. Sure. Uh, but if you, collective versus conforming, all of them too. Now, if you had to pick one though, um, I like Joe's was a little bit more specific. How are you trying to reconcile it? So that's really a separate question. And that's actually the core of my question. That's how we're going to bring about change. What are you doing? Ah, a lot of them depending on the day. Sure, definitely. Finding a balance between, between collectivisting and conforming. Anybody can get off mute, by the way, and share. Um, that's great. Finding a balance, how are you, but how are you doing that? Sometimes I like specifics, like what are you doing? Like instance, um, when, if I'm, as a parent saying, you know what, when, oh, I'm moving on to my next slide, but when parents, when kids share something with you, you actually decide, you know what, I'm not going to be looking at my phone and be stressed out because I'm busy working. I'll drop everything to listen to my kids. And that might be not be silent and stoic and give them feedback. Like, I'm sorry, what did you say? And I'll talk about it in the latter half. Lisa. Hi. Um, it, it took too forever to type, so I'm just going to unmute myself and talk. Love it. Um, Love it. So uh, for me, um, I'm born and raised in America, but um, so I attended the, the the child one last week or two weeks ago. But I'm also a parent, so it's going to be interesting to see how things intersect with me. <laughs> for me, um, I I joined the military right after 9/11, so for me, I feel like a lot uh, everything, but also suppressing emotions is is a huge one. Um, and I think. I've, I've come to terms with the fact that I am perfectionistic. I just, I just been discovering how and, 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 and all the many different aspects because there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, very achievement success driven, um, very silent, um, trying to conform, but then not sure what to conform to. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 
uh, go to the gym, plenty of that. And then for authoritarian, it's not, it's not so much filial piety for me, but it's more authoritarian because for me, it's, I'm, I'm trying to fit into the military structure. Um, so yeah, I have all the above. <laughs> but I, yeah, go ahead. The, the, sorry, I just, I, um, for me, I think the one I've been working on the most um, through therapy has been kind of undoing the suppressing emotions on my side uh just just from recognizing that oh like this is like this i think the emotional emotion wheel was uh was what my therapist showed me i think about three years ago and and so for me i had to translate it um into it, it helped me because I'm, I'm a linguist also so i speak korean and chinese um to translate the english emotions into into uh korean and english or korean and chinese so that i can get a better sense of what those emotions evoked and me meant because for me it took forever for me to even try to like be like i feel like this you know <laughs> so yeah it's it, i think for me and then that has also led it has led for me in in recognizing all the other stressors it's weird because like the way you're summarizing this and wrapping this all up is like light bulb light bulb light bulb why didn't i like hear of you before <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah well it's because it's all learning experience for me too right i love that you share that thanks for sharing that i really appreciate that uh well we don't have this let's what you're also talking about as a parent and as an adult child right we don't have that modeled you all hear that right modeled behavior like where did you learn it well nowhere <laughs> we're kind of learning it now so a lot of us were, you know, parents, even second generation, don't forget, we're a product of our parents. So some of this will make sense even as, you know, a second or third generation parent. So thanks so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, what, well, I don't know how old your kids are, but what do you hope to share about your experience? You know, saying to your kids, oh, I, I have trouble expressing emotions. I'm not saying you, can, you need to say that, but how old are your kids? Um, so I have one child, uh, one son, and so the thing is, like, I don't think he knows how I grew up either. He doesn't know, and and for me, I haven't really shared much um, either. And it's weird because it's only as he's become a teenager now, where it's like, oh shoot, like his his child and upbringing is definitely different from mine, but in very various different ways. Like for me, I remember um, when I became a parent, it was like, don't become a mom. Like that was my guiding light of like don't become like my mom, but let but then um, because the circumstances are different, you know, um, different father and like uh, and everything. It's just it's just yeah. He doesn't know my story, and and I it's difficult for me to share. Um, and and so and now because we are estranged, uh, it'll be interesting to see if if we can ever speak to each other and, and, and you know as adults to to share that, but um. But for me, this was an interesting question because I was like, oh, like, because the thing is, like, when, when would it be appropriate to to share anything like that, you know, um, of, of my childhood? Because it has been filled with trauma um, and child abuse, you know, and, and how much is oversharing? How much is is the right amount of, of sharing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And that's definitely something you have to explore further. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's like a set answer to that. But I will say the acculturation experience also includes like, you know, that connection with your, that the whole point is why I'm asking this question is for parents to connect with their kids. Like, you know, I'm not very good at sharing like my emotions and, and showing them to you, but I'm proud of you. That That's more me going in the second half on how we do that. But you could say it's because like my grandfather, your, I mean, sorry, my dad, your grandfather, I never heard it from him. And you, so you don't have to share about the trauma, but you could say, but I, because I never heard it and I always wanted to, I just feel like I'm really working hard to tell you that. So that's what I meant by connecting. Yeah. And it takes practice. And that's how I would admit it to your, and when I say acculturation experience, that's probably, that's what I meant more like, um, you can share about how some people can share how horrific an experience is. I don't always recommend that, but at a good time in life, my father told me later on about his experience much later. Like I was in my thirties and I was like, I never knew. And it was a crying moment for me because I was like, I just never knew because I was so spoiled and selfish. I mean, I was just like a selfish little brat that didn't care because I thought it was all about me. But when I realized, oh my God, they suffered because of the kids, not because of my behavior, just trying to raise us, that I was like, oh, no wonder there are, no wonder I have problems with being success driven because you were, 
you know, it just helped me understand me. So it's not something to think about, but depends on the um, situation. So thanks so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Let's read to Pinkers, my goodness, who wrote a story. Okay. So making peace with what happened by accepting what happened, not Rajesh, but rather radical acceptance of the facts of what happened. Helped, especially when trying to get away from binary of everyone is either bad or good. Ah, so I will be touching on that in the second half. Journaling life events, trauma events. Okay, great. Unclenched, internalized messaging. Sorry, I'm not going to read it completely because I, I want to make sure that we have time. Um, timeline to redefine family relationships with specific sociological insights. This is so deep, Topanker. You could have shared this, but I'm glad you wrote it. Um, power, hunger, transfer to healthy objectives, seeking mental health counseling, investing social hobby cultures, unlearning productivity, social roles. I love the word unlearning. Yes. So that's great. I think you alluded to pretty much all of them. I'm just making sure. I don't know if you had a specific one, but thank you so much for sharing that. And I do talk about judgments, either good or bad. Kayla, I do believe that is a great question. <laughs> I, this is why we're having this. So for parents to understand more about themselves and their own conflicts intergenerationally and trauma, I'm hoping perhaps that they'll get better at what, sh what appropriate sharing is with the kids. For instance, a lot of the things you hear about parents sharing is how tough it was for them, right? Or um, while well, you get to eat and I never ate, so I was starving. I mean, I heard that from my mom, but it's not to necessarily make, I don't think it meant to, meant to make, make me feel bad, but I think at one point I was like, I don't understand the purpose. So I believe from the parents end, and that's why I work with a lot of parents, there has to be an appropriate sharing. There is, you will know if it's inappropriate depending on your child's reaction. And if it's a traumatic experience, then it's not appropriate to share with your kid. Um, there's ways to share it like, yeah, it was difficult, but sharing your own trauma needs to come with an adult or with somebody that's not your child, basically what, what I'm saying. I always say this, adults are the adults. So their responsibility is ahead of the child's. And that's why parentification, as you notice, I'm not even talking about that because that's a whole nother level is not fair, right? That's, a whole, that's why there's trauma in that sense. But no, the adults have the responsibility first. So I always give parents and I put a lot of pressure on the parents first. That's why I do this for them to understand. So there is an inappropriate definitely sharing. By the way, there's a lot of secondary trauma in our families. So if I'm going to talk briefly on trauma, a lot of the secondary trauma you see is that kids like my age or second generation kids like your age struggling because their parents told them the stuff and then they're feeling like, oh my gosh, this could happen to me. Or they're thinking about it. They've been traumatized in a secondary sense. So that's also not good. Uh, the timing of the sharing is important. Totally. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot more to share. Anybody else want to share? They're really pressing to share. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to Panker, Kayla, Stephen, Joe. Timing is key. I think people ask me about timing. I will share that in the latter half. Timing. When is a good timing? So let's move on to, let me check. Yeah. Skills. Prideful parenting. I like sharing the word prideful. Uh, it has a negative connotation everywhere else, but in this sense, mental health, I want, especially with immigrant parents, Asian American parents, to exude that word because we're not prideful enough. Meaning it's not about being arrogant. It is about being confident. And I break it down. And I'm not saying you walk around saying, I'm a prideful parent, but I'm trying to get these concepts rooted in you so it shows the confidence. What's lacking is cultural confidence in the parenting, right? There is science behind prideful parenting, like talking about. It addresses, now prideful parenting is about the emotionality of the conversation, of sharing. It is not just about the facts, right? In our culture, I think Lisa shared about struggling with suppressing emotions. That's what we saw a lot of. So I want to boost prideful parenting because you get to the emotions behind somebody's words, what they're trying to say. I'll break that down. Oxytocin, maybe it's growing up with a doctor, father, whatever, but I love talking about hormones. So oxytocin is that bonding hormone, that love hormone you get when, with anything related to love. Hugs are what's released when you hug. 
I have actually heard a fun, sad fact that oxytocin levels are down because nobody's hugging as much because we're not seeing people as much. And COVID, you know how you, just the other day I saw a friend, I was like, hey, that's kind of sad. But that is when you're really engaged in prideful parenting and connecting with the emotionality, you release that hormone and that's when you'll feel the love and connection. And this has the power to make someone feel validated and heard. So parents who hear this, the end of the day, it's about being heard and being validated. Change comes, comes from that, but you don't hear me say, oh, and then you can end up doing this and be totally fine and conflicts resolved. Not at all. You just want to connect with the other person and make them feel like they're accepted. They're heard well and, uh, and validated. Like, I get it. That is so important. That's all kids want. This is how you break it down. Pride. So we'll break it down each of it. Okay. So let me see. Oops. Let me, oh, sorry. Let me see this. Um, making sure I don't do this. Oh, I gotta see that. I gotta see the meme. I love memes. Um, pride. Okay. So praise your kids. Reflectively listen, initiate conversation, describe instead of judge. So that's the judgment that the panker was talking about that I'll break down. Engage and connect. So that's just a fun acronym. I love acronyms. So remember that, and then I'll break it down a little bit more specifically. Okay, so we know what praise is. But in real definition, it really is our fundamental need. Okay, and I don't know about you, but uh, I didn't hear it much. Just being authentic. In our culture, not so much. It's not the norm. Okay, it, uh, people crave it. So in the workplace, because I'm a big advocate of workplace wellness, my goodness, when I say you guys have these employee recognition programs to uh, praise one another, do you know how the boost of e uh, ego, which ego in the sense of not like your head goes big and you're all obnoxious, but ego for the confidence is so needed in your work, in the workplace. Yes, exactly. Um, people, people want it. You know that. You, you do one thing. Kayla, Jed, you guys are doing so great with AMHC. Do you know how great that feels, right, when you hear that? It promotes cohesion. So the whole point when I say this to parents, don't you want to be able to communicate with your kids? When I just say communicate, you don't even hear me say effective. I just say communicate. This brings that together when you're praising them. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, this is overall term, totally overall term, completely. And, and just so you know, um, in some of the smaller parenting groups, I'll actually break down praise in a whole hour. Like, what does praise look like? So when was the last time you praised your kid? So I don't know how many parents are on this call, but when was the last time you did it? I ask because generally people are like, <laughs> that very thing we're all thinking about. And I can start with mine. The last time, and I was writing this going, oh my gosh, when was the last time? I think the last time I praised one of my kids was when he took off to college and when we moved him in six and a half weeks ago. So, and I have two kids in the house. So that's just my telling you it takes practice, right? And praise, I'll give you an example of a praise that Joe brought up, right? And I'm not even, academics is not even in my eye line right now. It's more something like, I just love the way you crack up. I love you laugh. I love how, I love when you laugh. You know, and, and I've heard that from other parents and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like the best, best praise ever. Right. Or I think you're, I think you're so good with your friends or you're such a good friend or, um, you know, I'm so glad when you do this and blah, blah, blah. That's praising. It's not achievement driven. I'm not saying, oh, I'm so glad you got an A or you're such a good student. That's praising too. But we're really talking about, okay, okay we'll see this meme. I can play that later. Um, we, we want to talk about the real praise, right? The, the crux of things. Yes, for later. I guess you really want to do that. So that's praise, okay? So that's an example of making sure you praise them. Think about doing that. That's actually the first thing I want you to do. Uh, reflectively listen. You've heard the term active listen. And it's similar, except reflective brings that word of like, think of a mirror image. So you're looking at your child and... Maybe he is your mirror, mirror image, Lisa, or she. And you're looking at them going, yeah, I'm looking at myself. But I want you to think that way. I'm looking at myself, so I'm listening. So I'm going to reflect what my child is telling me. So it really is almost where the child's telling you something and you're like repeating back or you're expressing sadness as well. 
So if the kid is crying, I'm not saying you're going to cry too, but some parents do cry if they see their kid crying or they're, they're, the kid's crying and you're like showing such sadness. So that's what I mean. I'm, taking, I'm asking you to take this literally. Why this is a way of releasing that hormone. You're really connecting. You are mirror imaging. So the kid's like seeing tears in your eyes and he or she is crying. They're like, yeah, mommy gets it or daddy gets it. You know, that's just super important for the kid to communicate with you more. Acknowledge, not assert. Huh? So, you know, in our culture, we're all about, well, you need to do this. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Thanks for sharing. So then that's why you're not doing well because you're not studying. I mean, you know, asserting your opinion and, and being the parent, right? Telling. Acknowledging. By the way, this all takes practice, right? It's not like you're going to go away to and be like, I'm so, I'm so good at this. No. But acknowledging is more like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you were so sad. You know, and you, you don't have to be that dramatic. I'm not that dramatic, but I'd be like, I didn't know that made you that upset. Or, um, okay, so you were really, really angry and that's why you slammed the door. And the kid's like, I just did that, right? And then you're like, okay. So that's acknowledging. And then what happens is you, I will guarantee, I almost see it in family therapy. I'm trying to think if I didn't see it, where something breaks down, where a child goes, well, yeah, yeah, you know, like the ch somebody gives in. Somebody, the mom's like, well, is, I saw you slam the door and then you did that. So you were really angry with me, right? That's acknowledging. Don't forget, I'm not saying you take away your emotions. I'm not saying, oh, cool, you're just totally spilling, you know, yelling at your mom and I'm good with it. I'm just saying acknowledge, reflectively listen. So if they're mad, you can get mad too. It happens. You're like, yeah, you slammed the door in your mom's face. The kid actually almost always backs down. Somebody backs down by saying, well, yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to slam in your face, but I was so mad. You always hear something like that. I wish I could record those conversations to prove to you, but I see that because there's a reflective image happening. And then the kid's seeing, it's almost like when you need to see how mad you are, you back down like that. Have you, you know what I'm talking about? But I wanted to give you that. So that's my version of active listening. I really want us to be mirror images of our kid, of our student, of our um, children. So forming reflections, it's not that hard to do. This is actually pretty simple. Take some time to practice this, but you're really trying to understand the other person's meaning. So I will share with you as, as a therapist I am, I'm not the best listener to my kids, right? I tend to, you want to assert, you want to get them to, mm -hmm, you're, you're hearing them and you're like, mommy wants you to do this, right? I have to work hard to form reflections. So you're really trying to get the meaning behind words. I'll give an example. It should be, by the way, it should be said in a statement. I forgot the word said. Should be in a statement of understanding. You don't go, so Kayla, you're upset? No. You wanna say, Kayla, I see that you're upset or you're mad at me. And you see, you see some moms do that in TV shows. I actually make mental notes. Watch the white TV shows. And you're like, oh, that's a good reflection, right? And then the kid's like, yeah, I'm mad at you. Well, I'm not really mad. I'm just really, actually, I'm sad. And then things come out. You are trying to have a productive conversation. That's the whole point. You want to be able to communicate with the kids, even if it's tough, and have them share things that you're like, oh, I didn't, I want revelations. I want things like, well, I didn't know that I was that, you know, upsetting you, things like that. Um, it actively engages you. So when I say it actively engages you, I don't just mean you're listening. You're actually like watching and then literally seeing, oh, I think my, my, my son's about to cry. Like, have you ever been in a situation where you're talking to somebody and you know they're holding back tears or um, you know that they're really mad at you and you sense it, but they're very calm, you know, that kind of thing? This is what I mean. When you are completely engaged, one of the Chinese translations working, and your, your, your body language, everything to the point that you're like, and it and expresses it. By the way, this comes naturally when you do reflectively listen. I really believe it comes out. But the statement of understanding, try to practice that. It does not mean you're upset. Are you mad? It's like, you're mad. I see you totally upset. Let me go to the, let me go to the examples of reflections. These are the classic ones, but there's many. But okay, what I hear from you, and you hear some people saying this, especially in business, what I hear from you is, let me see if I understand you. You're really upset. I wouldn't talk to you, and this is why you're screaming. You know, you, you sit and then let them, let them clarify. Let the listener or the person who's sharing with you to clarify if it's wrong. And then you could say, it's really challenging for you to, or um, I can see that it's really tough for you to talk to me. Great reflective listening, right? I can see that you're feeling sad. 
you know? And if they're like, yeah, I'm sad. I mean, you know, it's okay. Say it. By the way, I just said in a question, so that's wrong. So I can see that you're feeling sad. I can see that you're feeling mad. It looks like you're, and the classic one I always do is, it looks like you're about to cry or it looks like you're about to scream or it looks like you're about to throw something, you know, and that'll just change things. And maybe they're about to and they don't. So it's about reflecting to really connect with them. And I get the sense that. So these are just very basic ones. There may be, there are other good ones in Chinese or Korean. There's ones that you can do as well, but you can't really, it's, it's hard for me to grasp, even if I speak some conversational Korean, how to do this because it's just not innate in our culture. But when I'm talking to parents that can get this, do try. It's not hard. And here's what I say to parents. I'm assuming if you're in the workplace, whatever your workplace is, depending on your age, you do this at work. So if you're doing this at work uh, or with your employees, employers, then I guarantee you can do it to your kids. So that's my thing of holding parents accountable. And I'm like, you do this at work, you can do this to your kids. You can do this with your kids, right? Let's see if I'm missing something with reflection. Okay. So that's reflection. I'm going to do Hanker's thing about judgmental. So this is a skill, I'm sure you've heard of, but it's about, I love this. Because it is not, it's a, t it's a tough skill. It's not something you just one day wake up and go, oh, yeah, let me practice non being non-judgmental. We do this naturally, not just in Asian American culture, everywhere. We tend to assign a value to us, as Depenker was saying, I'm good, I'm bad, he's bad, she's good, he's, he's good at this, he can't do that. We do it everywhere. But it, assigning a value can really cause someone stress on yourself and on the other person. I'll break that down. Instead, you want to use descriptions. You want to be able to explain, and this is Lisa's struggle, really try and um, express that emotion and describe what's going on. Actually, if you describe what's going on, what naturally comes out is what you're feeling, your opinions, um, anything related to you is what happens. I'll break it down examples. These are the things I tend to hear the most. You know, I'm not good enough. I can't do anything right. Well, I was never good enough. That's one. Done. Oh, sorry. Uh, I hear this a lot too. My colleagues are always putting me down. They're horrible to work with. This is if you're in the workplace, which parents are, or like my employee, employee never listens to me. Um, they're, they're terrible. They're disrespectful. I'm a terrible parent. I'm a terrible friend. Um, I'm not a great coworker. She's a terrible coworker. My kids are so disrespectful. I actually heard that recently. And, um, and you know, that someone just said, yeah, my kids are so disrespectful. They talk back to me all the time, uh, blah, 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 kept going. And then we had to change it into a description. These, when you think this way, it does project in your behavior and it does disengage you. So I'm a terrible parent, so whatever, I'm going to keep going. You know, you have to do it this way, right? Or I'm not good enough. I can't do anything right, so I might as well. You see this and that's what happens. It's distressful. It kind of make, gives you that lack of confidence and changes your behavior. So when you, when you actually describe it, when you put things in descriptions, this is how, so this one, sorry. So the first one, I'm not good enough. I can't do anything right. Sometimes I make mistakes, but I'm trying to learn or I keep trying. That's a, that's a great way of rewording that. Yeah, or some, I don't really understand it, but I really do want to understand it, a description, right? My colleagues don't understand how hard I'm working, which makes me mad or, you know, it, it really pisses me off that, that my co colleagues don't get it, that they can't see what I'm doing for them. I hear that all the time. That's a description. Do you hear that? I'm upset. I feel frustrated. I get left out because they don't see how hard I'm working. Not like they're terrible to work with, right? Again, these aren't, I'm going to be clear, judgments are normal to say. I'm just trying to help you be less distressed as you're thinking about things and interacting with your kids. These are examples with kids. This can translate everywhere though, even with each other. I don't have all the answers about how to parent. That was the way I reworded it. I'm like, you don't know everything. How, how, like, okay, you're not a terrible parent. You're learning or I'm still learning about myself. That was one of the things that someone actually said. And I was like, just sh say that you're still, you're, you're 50 and you're a parent, but that doesn't mean you've lived your entire life and you know everything. Your child's young. So just say, you know, parenting is new to me. I don't know. My, I was never close to my parents, so this is completely new experience. That's a great description. And then the last one is, this is how we reworded it. So my kids are so disrespectful. 
you know, they don't, don't listen. To, all they do is talk about blah, blah, that's what I heard, you know, and then you're like, okay. So how do we say that in a description? And the parent's like, ah, uh, you know, and this is what we came up with. So in the end, he was actually hurt. He was like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually trying to talk to them. Um, and then, so when they, they actually end up hurting my feelings when they talk back to me, I was like, I never knew that. Like, that's a great description. Wow. You were actually hurt. I wouldn't have known. I just thought, you know, you were just mad, but he actually said hurt. So again, it helps yourself understand what you're processing. Right. Um, and, and again, it takes practice. So I can think of many of them, but these are the ones that I feel like we all tend to say in here. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, challenge you guys. Turning, turn a judgment into a description. So maybe you say something to yourself or say something about your family or say something about your kid. Why don't you say that judgment and turn it into a description? Anybody want to try? Take a second to think. And how about somebody do an attempt? Think of a judgment you tend to say. Again, a value placed on yourself, on somebody else, and then turn it into what's going on, really. Who wants to try? I'm going to do this uh, Jeopardy wheel. Da, na, na, na. Somebody's got to have an example. I can give you one. This will help. Parents tend to sometimes complain about their kids. Uh, my son doesn't get good grades or my son is not, you know, straight A student or my daughter uh, is, my daughter doesn't talk in class. She never raises her hand. You know, she doesn't really participate. Kind of like, um, I hear this a lot with online learning. What's the other one that I really heard a lot? Um, Oh yeah, I, 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 my daughter is just super shy, period. She doesn't talk up in, in Google Meet online classes. So, and she was frustrated. So I said, okay, again, you could say a judgment, and I can't believe I didn't say this either. You could say a judgment and it may not be distressing to you, but if it's distressing to you, like when you're saying, my daughter won't speak up in class, she's so shy, that is when I'll say, let's turn into a description, what's really going on, right? And so we thought about this because I think it really bothered this mom. And so the description came out to be, well, it reminds me of how I was in class. Like I could never speak up. I could never raise my hand. So it was, so it became more about her story of how she got frustrated seeing her daughter sit there looking like a zombie because she knew her daughter knew the answer. So what she was trying to say is, yeah, I actually knew the answer. Like she goes, I was actually really smart. I just could never raise my hand. This is actually a parent that grew up in Korea that shared this. But, and that was a very poignant moment because it did make her cry because I was like, what's going on with you? So emotionally, she was feeling the own stress because she was seeing, great, great, my daughter's just like me, right? So that's what happens. Um, my parents only see me as com commodified as a product like raising livestock instead of rearing children. Oh my goodness, that is a uh, big judgment. Description. The model minority myth and fast-paced immigrant acculturation into U.S. did not provide my parents with enough time and resources to process their ancestral ethnic identities with family life and have space to process their own stressors and imposter syndrome in a country that doesn't fully understand them. So that is a very interesting that you talk about that to, to Panker. I just realized I can't see, um, can you guys see the subtitle still? Okay. Um, that's great. So that was just you doing, a, you providing a judgment into a description based on how you saw your parents. Now, is that something that that you came up because I asked for an example, or is that something you really believe? Meaning, is that really your description? So, Because that is, that's fairly well said. I would try to word it in a little less academic speak, but so you could, you know, really um, process it on your own. But yeah, that's exactly a great example of a description. <laughs> yes. But yeah, I mean, like, wow, my parents um, just see me as, you know, like you hear this a lot. They just want me to live out their life. What's that? What's that wording? Um, they're trying to live through me, vicariously through me. And you hear, see, hear a lot of bitterness. And then you could think of the description. Well, my parents never went to college. So I know it was hard for them. You know, that's kind of what Topanka is getting at. But anyways, this takes practice. This isn't like you just do like this, but it's a way of just rewording 
and describing what you're really looking at, what's the feeling you're getting. Lisa, Lisa, this might take some practice too, just about what am I really feeling? Because I tend to just say this because that's what my parents just said. They didn't show any emotions. They just judged, lack of a better word, right? Um, so yeah, that's judgment versus description. Now let's get to communication. Okay, so this is a motivational interviewing technique. So I, when I, um, and I tend to actually preach this in corporate because this works when you're managing conflict. So it really translates well with the family. So you go through this because Asian parents tend to ask closed questions. Why are you mad? Oh, so descriptions need to be personal? No, not always. No, not always, especially when you're talking about the other person, right? So if you're analyzing, if you're thinking the you're trying to judge the other person going, my colleagues are this way, what's going on is I think she's really nervous about me uh, or I make her nervous. I mean, it could be something like that, right? So you're not being personal about it, but it could be you're trying to understand the other person. So that might be the, I don't know if that's a good example, but hopefully I answer that question. It doesn't have to be just about you. It's how somebody, but it will say it relates to how you relate to the other person and vice versa. Okay. Um, Cause you can't analyze somebody else. Right. So, ors, uh, open-ended questions. This, well, I'll break it down a little bit, but Asian parents tend to just ask, cause I'm always like, no, you're just going to get a yes or no answer from your kid. Is that what you want? That's not going to go anywhere. Yes. Fine. Good. Ask the questions that provoke longer answers and not just yes or no. Affirm, same as praise. It's very similar. Reflective listening and summarize. So I'm going to break it down. Or is in motion. Example. Oh, what did I say to upset you? Or what did I just say that you're, you're about to walk away right now? You know, we do that in person, but do we do that with our kids? We do that to each other, you know? And I see this all the time and I'm like, parents, you do this to your friends. Why can't you do this with your kids? So, and again, be very bold. Like, what did I just do to piss you off? Like I did that to one of my kids the other day, right? Oh, you keep nagging, right? You keep, you're getting, you're getting a conversation, even if it's heated, then you can go through the affirmation. Well, thanks for telling me this. Sorry. Thanks for telling me this. Or yeah, I appreciate you sharing with me. I mean, what, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be great if you could say that to your kids or thank you for taking the time to talk to me, you know, or, um, mommy really, really likes it when you are sitting next to me and telling me all this stuff, that's all affirming, right? Um, to provoke more conversation, to really communicate. I hear you telling me, so reflective listening after you, after you have them answer the questions and you're like, okay, so then you really got upset. So I got, I got you upset because I kept nagging about SAT work. Yes, mom, blah, 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 right? A softened tone always comes out of it. Yes, you did that. Okay, so I, I did get you mad. And then what happens is what? And I'm not always saying this because it doesn't always happen, but usually what happens after a reflective listening is somebody apologizes. I'm not gonna always say that though because that doesn't always happen, but usually it does. And then I wanna be clear on what you said. So summarize, this is a really great tool. When you're in, court, when you're in any workplace, when you're in any meeting, do you leave and just go by, see ya? Usually there's a wrap up, right? There's a wrap up of what just was spoken. When you're even with a client, you kind of go, go over things that they need to do so it's clear before someone leaves. You need to do that with your kids as well. Because even after going all through this, you may not quite get it. I've seen it happen. Parents still have to work on their listening. They don't, they're not always there because they're busy doing everything. So you have to say, okay, I wanna be clear so that you don't get upset like this again and, and then I'm not upset and getting mad at you. So what we just discussed was, and then we're gonna do, and then you, and then you want mom and dad to do this. I, I, I mean, and then the kid, you, what you'll see happen is, yes, that works. And what you both leave with, maybe the conflict is still being managed. However, you leave with an understanding and clarity because in our culture, clarity doesn't come easily, right? So it's about what, you're trying to get at. And even if no change happens, like going, okay, well, I'll try not to keep nagging about your schoolwork, whatever happens. And you can't, just because you said that doesn't mean you'll stop nagging. I just guarantee there's an understanding, a validation, an empathy that happens in the family that the kid, your child or children feel connected. They'll just walk away and go, well, that was, they're not gonna say, well, that was nice. They'll be like, okay. But in their head and heart, what's going on is a connection. And then the next time you're addressing a, a conflict, it may be better. It won't be as crazy, right? 
Let's see what Kayla asked. Apologies, what if you have no intention of doing what it is they want you to do? Okay, why don't you give me an example and then we'll walk through it because I know that happens. So I'm assuming you're talking as a kid about a parent. No, I mean, like in any situation, um, if you're, you know, reflecting, I hear you telling me this or I hear that you want this from me, mm -hmm. but you disagree with that. Um, so how do you respond? And you disagree. So nothing here I say to you is, uh, you have to agree with anything. You just, you, what I'm hoping to see is a productive conversation that somehow you can say, well, I hear you saying that, but the reason why I'm pushing you on this is because I really want this to happen. Right. And then what I hope next is the kid going, okay, I just, my mom, I felt like my mom or dad connected with me. They get me. All right. What you see is maybe some sort of compromise. You know, maybe you might not see the kid going, love it, love it, love it, love it. But I want you to get the fact that maybe the kid will say, okay, fine, I'll try my best. You know what I mean? Or fine, I got it. Okay, so the next time you nag me, I'll tell you. This is not a positive like, hey, we're good to go. But what you're, I'm hoping for is conversation that's more enriched. Any kind of change in the family that is mindfully managing the anxiety, right? Even communicating, I mean, think about it. When you even have one solid communication, I, I, get, I want you to think back now, did you ever walk away and feel like something was going to change? What changed was the way you communicate and that helped you connect. And then that brings about change. So am I making sense? So you can disagree. You don't have to always sit there going, oh, I hear you saying that you're mad. Good. No, you can say, I, I see that you're mad. Then you go on saying, well, the reason why you probably got mad at me is because I was so mad at you because you told me you were going to do this and you didn't, blah, 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 whatever a kid says. Joe saying, I want to clarify description. It is more about how the person feels about the situation, not necessarily make a personal take them personally. Ah, yes. It's about the context. Thanks for asking that question. It's about your own opinions. Um, and your opinions, by the way, are your, your opinions, right? That's why I talked about mindful uh, identity. Your reality is your reality. So how you see things going, yeah, this is what's going on. I'm really hurt by this. Or this person seems to be very upset, which is why he or she called me out on something. So it's not about taking it personally, no. But it's... When you actually describe something, you're more in control because what you're doing is expressing emotions and thought and feelings. So all the suppressing of emotions also comes out with how you feel about something, how you think about something, what your opinions are. So no, this is not about making it personal or taking it personally, but exactly being able to share openly your own opinions in the context. One of the things I say as a systemic therapist is that you're, especially in the family, you have to always think in context. What's going on in the family? That's why I say that quote, um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's why you have one person, then you have another person, but then you're not communicating. So that, that whole makeup of a family is disheveled, flustered, right? But if you're all together in one, I'm not saying it doesn't say it's like happy, peaceful, happy-go-lucky, when there's harmony because you're communicating and there's conflict being addressed, conflict being managed, then what happens is the context shifts. So hopefully I'm making sense there, but thanks for asking that. Yeah. And that takes practice. I think yeah, I usually do it over so many certain sessions. And even then when I talk about it in corporate organizations, I have to really go through exercises to do that. So, and it's not in our nature. We right away want to judge. It's not just, I'm not talking about being Asian American, just in general, right? So this takes some practice. So thanks for asking for that clarity. What's the key to happiness? This is the last slide. What is the key to happiness? It's a test question. I believe I touched on it last month or two weeks ago. Anybody could take a guess too. Healthy relationships, Kayla says. Anyone else want to take a guess? Open communication, internal joy. Steven, that is a good guess considering we're talking about communication. I want the Asian answer. Go ahead, just give it to me. Ah <laughs> is that still the Asian answer? I guess it could be that and prestige, degrees, good career, right, yeah. Okay, so the real answer is, um, I'm going to explain it to you. And this is how I tend to get parents my point. Not just parents in general, but the key to happiness, not according to Jeannie Chang, 
but I endorse this key to happiness. The Harvard Happiness Study, famous study, famous study, the longest running study on happiness. And the reason why it's really important to me is because I, because I know some people at Harvard who are kind of ingrained in that atmosphere of studying this. It's an 84 year old study, I was trying to do the math. JFK was one of the original participants. And of course, so that's why they're all men because back then Harvard was all male. So they wanted to track these men over time. I think what's left is four or five men are left now. And, um, and they track them and ask them qualitative questions and quantitative. So qualitative, more like asking, hey, what's making you happy? What's blah, blah, blah. How are you with your spouses, your siblings, your neighborhood? And then the other quantitative part was looking at their brains. They're, look, they're looking at MRI scans, okay? Um, being from Harvard, yeah. Isn't it funny? Because when I bring up the Harvard one, I'm like, yes, it's a Harvard study. Yes, great points for Asians. But the whole point was by age 50, they already knew, their predictor was, they already knew what would predict the key to happiness for these men to guarantee long life, but they looked at their brains. And so what they said was, this man is healthier. <laughs> um, that's part of it. So when they saw the brains, they saw the thicker brains indicating that these men were happier in their relationships based on all the interviews. And they're just not looking at the brains. They're, look, they're asking the questions of the, the participants. They're asking the participants' siblings and grandkids and kids, right? Because these men are in their 90s plus. And, and then they're looking at the brains of the other people that did not have healthy or quality, yes, Lisa, quality relationships. So when I say quality, I mean everything I just talked about today, connecting. And change comes from that you know, and it's very abstract. It's not like you're going to walk away and this is what's going to happen. But I believe when you connect and there's collaboration and cohesion and family change happens in the way that you would want. Um, so they, the Harvard client line that they say that I love that I'll say, especially to Asian parents is loneliness kills. And it's just as powerful as smoking and alcoholism. And I'm sharing this to parents because I need them to understand that at the end of the day, even kids, adult kids, their parents want to have connection and they do want quality relationships. When I say that, you feel connected, you feel loved. Um, and they do mean literally, yeah, they saw their brains. Depressive brains apparently look, have that, you know, those squiggly lines of the brain, it's thin. It was thinning out. And the, the happier brains were thick and had this great, and I equate it as, you know, when you're stressed, your hair falls out. You hear about this. Maybe you guys are too young, but it's the same thing. When your brain is thinning out, it's because it's just impacted over time by stress, unhappiness. So you want thick brains. Mindfulness helps with that. That's a whole nother, but I always bring this up because I want Asian parents to understand that that is the key to happiness. Nobody dies actually saying, you know, I'm so glad that I, Steve Jobs, do you guys know what Steve Jobs said at, this is a fun trivia quote as I end. Do you guys know what Steve Jobs said at the end on his deathbed? obviously something related to quality relationships. He said something very poignant um, and he had terrible relationships. I mean, his daughter talks about it, right? Her trauma um, with his kids. He shared, I should have spent more time with my family on his deathbed. Now they were all there. And I think I've, I heard that he passed away at peace because all his family were there, but he didn't say, man, I'm so successful, <laughs> you know, I'm iPhone, Apple, whatever, no. So I'm just sharing that because I'm just emphasizing what is not in our culture that I'm saying to you. That is why there's angst. That's why there's therapy. That's probably why we're in business, you know? So I'm not saying that I wanna stay like that in business. I'm just trying to share how powerful connectivity is. And I say this to parents, how many parents are on the call, that it's about the quality of your relationships. So that was it. Feel free, you can uh, connect with me. This is, you could just take a snapshot of, not me, but of the QR code. And um, this is the time to ask questions. Uh, a little bit over, but yeah, so that is it.